All right, welcome to another biochemistry lecture, this one on the topic of mitochondria and energy metabolism. Now, if you saw my last lecture, this one will be a little bit different stylistically, and that will be including more visual images to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. So if you have the ability to pull up slides and actually follow along, it will give you a much clearer understanding of some of the different pathways that we're discussing and how they connect. Now, that said, I'll also be including a lot of information on other functions of mitochondria beyond just energy production and those pathways. So even if you aren't able to pull up any visual aids and you're just following along or listening to this, then you'll still get a lot out of this. So first off, what are mitochondria? Many of you have probably heard the phrase, the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Now, there is a lot of truth to this. Mitochondria do play a really key role in energy production, but they also have some other functions, which I'll be discussing here as well. So essentially, I'm going to be breaking this into two halves. The first half, we're going to be discussing energy metabolism and the pathways leading up to it, both in the cell and in the mitochondria. And then in the second half, I'm going to go into a little bit more of the obscure, less well-known research on mitochondria that I've come across and some of the properties that they possess that make them extremely interesting as far as the different components of cells go. So as far as the origin of mitochondria, mitochondria actually were previously thought to be single-celled organisms or bacteria living independently of larger cells. So these are what, is no, what are known as prokaryotic cells. And then mitochondria and chloroplasts were essentially assimilated into larger cells, creating eukaryotic cells, which are cells that contain so-called other bacteria or symbiotic bacteria living inside them. And eukaryotic cells then went on to allow for the creation of multi-celled organisms and eventually humans. So Mitochondria had a few things that made them very unique and useful as far as being assimilated into larger cells. Essentially, around the time that this is believed to happen, the planet experienced its first major extinction event, and this occurred due to the advent of photosynthesis. So photosynthetic bacteria, bacteria that are able to harness sunlight to fuel energy production, began using carbon dioxide as the primary cofactor for this process. They essentially converted carbon dioxide into sugar, creating oxygen as a byproduct. So they were able to take the carbon out of carbon dioxide and use it to create larger molecules. Now, as a result of this, the atmosphere of the Earth saw a significant shift from being carbon dioxide heavy to being very oxygen heavy. Oxygen is specifically very reactive with some of the key metals that were being used as cofactors in cells at this time. Specifically iron and copper and some of the other uh, transition metals oxidize very easily, especially in their water soluble forms. So the, before this, the cells were essentially using mostly the water soluble forms of these metals. And when this oxidation occurred, they began to experience an increase in oxidative stress and cellular damage as a result of it. Now, mitochondria are uniquely resistant to this, and this made them very important here because they're able to actually use the increase in oxygen to fuel their own energy production. And they essentially invert the process that chloroplasts carry out. And I'll get to that in a bit. But basically, mitochondria have the ability to use oxygen, and they have the ability to uniquely protect themselves against oxidation with a very high antioxidant capacity. So it's likely that they were functioning well on their own because of this change in the environment. And then they were assimilated into larger organisms. And around the same time, we also saw the assimilation of chloroplasts, which are some of those photosynthetic bacteria, into larger organisms as well. Eukaryotic cells that assimilated both chloroplasts and mitochondria went on to become plants and other organisms in that family. And then the cells that just assimilated mitochondria went on to form animal life and other things in that family. So essentially, there's a kind of cycle that exists between the chloroplasts and the mitochondria. 
the chloroplast fixes the carbon from carbon dioxide into carbohydrates, which are based on carbon and hydrogen primarily, as the name suggests. These carbohydrates most specifically would be the simple sugars early on and then later on more complicated complex carbs. So the byproduct of this could be thought of as oxygen and glucose. Mitochondria then reverse this process. The mitochondria uses the electrons and protons that it gathers from glucose to fuel the majority of its energy production and it puts off carbon dioxide and water as its primary byproducts. So both of these are then used by the chloroplast and the cycle continues. Now, if you look at the image on the right here, you see an interesting uh, setup of proteins in a row. This is the energy production pathway in the chloroplast where two of the uh, energy production proteins are essentially fueled by light. And this occurs in the uh, the, what are called the chloroplast stroma, which are these, these stacked, uh, they almost look like stacks of pancakes inside the chloroplast. Now, looking at this image, I want you to take a good look at it and then let me show you the main energy production pathway in mitochondria. This is what's known as the electron transport chain. You'll see the similarities here. Both chloroplast and mitochondria use a very similar setup when it comes to energy production. They use what are called cytochromes, which primarily make energy by transporting electrons from one cytochrome to the next, to the next, to the next, and at the same time taking protons, which are depicted here as H+, since hydrogen is one proton and one electron, H+, denotes the fact that it's a proton without an electron. So they use these cytochromes to pump protons across a membrane. Now, mitochondria are also unique in the fact that they actually contain two membranes. Most cells would just contain one at this time, but mitochondria found a way to harness energy production even further by adding an extra membrane. And this essentially allows them to create an inner membrane space, kind of a thin envelope around the edge of the mitochondria where they can fill that envelope with protons. Now, you can almost think of this as if you had a lot of water inside a cloth bag. So the cloth bag isn't stopping the flow of water back through it, but it does limit it somewhat. But essentially, the desire of the water to uh, balance out between whatever uh, sides of the membrane that it's on is going to cause it to flow out of the cloth bag and fill whatever container you put it in instead until there's a fairly even amount of water inside the bag and outside the bag. So this is the tendency of protons, and this is what's called osmosis. So what happens here is the mitochondria actually harnesses this flow. And what you see here on the right is what's known as the ATPase or the ATP synthase enzyme. It's not well depicted here, but it actually looks like a motor if you actually see it in action. It has a series of wheels or spokes almost that each of them can hold one proton and it causes it to rotate as the protons flow through. So essentially the osmotic force that is created when you have a lot of hydrogen on one side and much less on the other causes the hydrogen to flow through this and create a sort of pressure. And this causes the rotation of this enzyme, almost like a motor. It actually rotates as fast as 9,000 rotations per minute, which for those of you, you that don't know is actually faster than the rotation of a sports car engine. So this is a very significant amount of force. Now, this ATPase enzyme is linked to the production of ATP. So essentially, every time this, en this uh, enzyme rotates a certain degree, it actually adds a phosphate group to ATP, converting it from ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate, or adenosine with two phosphates added to it, to ATP, or adenosine triphosphate, where there's an extra phosphate added. And this kind of creates an energy storage in ATP because you're essentially creating a, a source of chemical energy, where any molecule that's broken down is gonna re release some energy. ATP is a very efficient and simple way to store this energy. Now, there's something interesting I should note here in that it's actually thought that while a lot of the energy 
produce is coming from the what's called the proton motive force or the proton motion. There's also a kind of driving force that pushes the protons into the inner membrane space. Now, this force is thought to actually occur as a result of the electron flow and be a result of a electromagnetic field being created. Now, this is not necessarily the dominant hypothesis for this, but I do believe it holds the best weight when it comes to the actual evidence for it. And I'll link some studies down in the description below to uh, show you guys that evidence. But essentially, when you have the flow of charged particles, you actually create an electromagnetic field automatically. Now, the electrons flow from cytochrome 1 to cytochrome 2 to cytochrome 3 to cytochrome 4 as a result of the cytochromes being progressively more positively charged. So it's essentially a greater degree of attraction with each cytochrome protein, and this causes the electrons to be drawn in a kind of linear motion across these proteins. Now, it should also be noted that these proteins are essentially free-floating, in the membrane. So while it's kind of organized in a very unique, uh, neat kind of lined up way in this image, this isn't necessarily how it's going to play out in the actual mitochondria itself. One or multiple of the cytochromes may not actually be present. So it doesn't necessarily go from one to two to three to four, but it does always travel in that direction, even if two is left out or three is left out, etc. So essentially, as the electrons flow up this kind of charge gradient, they create an electromagnetic force. And this seems to be what draws hydrogen ions across this membrane. It's interesting to note here that this seems to be the best explanation due to the fact that they actually don't have binding sites for the protons to be bound to this protein and carried across in all cases. So I believe it's uh, cytochrome 1, 2, and 3 have the binding sites for this, but cytochrome 4 does not. So even though cytochrome 4 does still transport protons across, it doesn't have any site that binds to this, so it seems to be driven by some other force than the chemical binding. Now, the protons and electrons are gathered up through what's known as the citric acid or the TCA cycle. This is another key aspect of energy production. Now, you'll notice that in the last, uh, in the last image I showed you guys that there wasn't any carbon dioxide being produced as a byproduct. Essentially, oxygen is split in oxidative phosphorylation, and it's turned into water using some of the protons as a byproduct. So essentially, you have water being produced as the primary byproduct of cellular energy metabolism or, mi or mitochondrial energy metabolism. Carbon dioxide is secondary. It's just kind of the more well-known. Now, Carbon dioxide is produced by the other processes of energy metabolism. The, the TCA cycle is one of the key processes here. You'll notice that if we look between the two images, the, uh, in the oxidative phosphorylation cycle, the cytochromes use different cofactors to accept electrons and protons and then give them uh, or transport them across the membrane or give them to the next cytochrome protein. So some of these cofactors actually overlap with those of the citric acid cycle. And this is how electrons and protons are taken from the citric acid cycle and fed into oxidative phosphorylation. So the first cytochrome one uses NAD plus as a cofactor. So you'll see in uh, three points in this cycle, we actually see electrons and protons being fed from these intermediates in this cycle into NAD+. And then uh, FAD is another one that is not depicted here, but it also is used as a cofactor for one of these cycles. Now, the intermediates actually are fed in from two processes called glycolysis and beta oxidation, which I'll get to in a moment. But glycolysis essentially is the breakdown of glucose, which is uh, liberated from longer chain carbohydrates, uh, you, or sometimes you consume glucose itself, or fructose, which is found in fruit and certain processed foods, can also be converted into fructose or glucose. So glucose is the main kind of intermediate that's used to start the process of 
glycolysis. And then as glucose is broken down, the end product that's created is pyruvate, which almost looks like half of a glucose molecule. So pyruvate is then converted into acetyl-CoA, and then that's converted into citrate and fed into this citric acid cycle. Now, fatty acids are metabolized through a process called beta-oxidation, and beta-oxidation forms acetyl-CoA. So it bypasses pyruvate and goes directly to acetyl-CoA, but it still feeds into this cycle. So essentially, both carbohydrate and fat metabolism are accomplishing the same goal of separating out protons and electrons so that they can be fed into the oxidative phosphorylation process. For context or comparison here, the processes like glycolysis only actually create something like four to eight ATP molecules per run of the cycle, whereas oxidative phosphorylation actually creates something like 32. Briefly, if we look at the glycolysis and beta oxidation pathways themselves, in the glycolysis pathway, we see glucose essentially being broken down into this longer chain version of its ring structure, and then that chain essentially being split up into multiple different components and its hydrogen atoms being rearranged. This is to deplete deuterium because deuterium slows down mitochondrial metabolism. I'll be doing a separate lecture on this at some point because it's very interesting. But this is where the water is being created as a byproduct, and then it actually uses up some ATP as well. So it's kind of like an energy loss to be able to gain energy later on. This is part of the reason why when cells switch to primarily glycolysis, when oxidative phosphorylation is dysfunctional for some reason, that energy production is much less efficient and there's a increased creation of some of these different byproducts that aren't necessarily beneficial for the cell. This is seen a lot in cancer cell metabolism, for example. Now in beta oxidation, um, this doesn't show the full cycle really, but essentially the fatty acid is taken into the cell and part of the fatty acid metabolism occurs in the general cell and then part of it is taken into the mitochondria. So when it gets to acyl carnitine, it actually is then taken into the cell and carnitine is used as a cofactor for this transporter. This is why carnitine is important for fatty acid metabolism. And then uh, acyl carnitine is converted into fatty acyl CoA and then through beta oxidation, that's converted into acetyl-CoA, which is then fed into the TCA cycle. So essentially both of these processes are really leading up to the TCA cycle. And that's what's really key here is the creation of the protons and electrons, which can be used in oxidative phosphorylation, just because that produces exponentially more energy than any of these other processes. Now, beyond energy metabolism, I also want to discuss some of the interesting interactions that mitochondria have with light. Now, to understand this, first, you need to understand the role of what are called chromophores. A uh, chromophore is essentially any compound that absorbs specific wavelengths of light, and these can be used in a variety of different ways in the body. So one of the best examples of this is in photoreceptors, which are the receptor proteins that actually interact with light and allow you to see. A compound called retinol, which is spelled like retina with an A on the end, uh, it's actually a vitamin A analog, absorbs light and is actually excited or its structure is altered slightly as a result. And this causes a signal to be sent to the nervous system, allowing you to see. Now, this excitation occurs as a result of what's known as the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect essentially states that light only has the ability to interact with electrons. So the structure changes that we see in retinol, for example, are a result of it losing an excited electron, which is picked up by one of the other molecules around it. And this causes its structure to change in a way that's picked up by the cell. Then when this electron re-enters the molecule, this acts as the signal, the structure changes back, and this acts as a signal that transmits the impulse into the nervous system. So essentially, the different compounds in the body that interact with light allow light to have dynamic effects on biology that in many cases are not often discussed. 
So some of the other examples of this, for example, are chlorophyll in plants. Chlorophyll absorbs most of the light spectrum but reflects green light because it has a very low energy level. And essentially the electron excitation from chlorophyll is used to drive energy metabolism in chloroplasts. Other examples include, for example, melanin, which is, as many of you know, increased in the skin when you're exposed to UV light, and this specifically absorbs UV light um, and basically doesn't allow it to interact with other molecules in the cell as well. So it essentially acts as a filter for UV light. There are some other interesting interactions with light as well, including the cytochrome proteins, which I mentioned earlier in the mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation process. So essentially what we actually see happen is that when certain parts of the light spectrum hit mitochondria, the electrons in the cytochrome proteins, which as you may remember are transporting the electrons across from one protein to the next, to the next, to the next, the electrons are excited and this actually causes them to be transported to the next uh, protein faster. So it actually speeds up this process. Now, you may remember cytochrome 4 at the end of this kind of electron transport chain. This is actually the rate limiting process in oxidative phosphorylation. So cytochrome 4, which is also known as cytochrome C oxidase, actually is excited specifically by the red and infrared light spectrum. Infrared plays a bigger role here because it actually is the ability to penetrate a decent distance into the body. It goes just below the skin, actually as far as 10 inches into the body. Now, UV light on the opposite end of the spectrum has a very limited penetration, so it only affects the skin, which is why there's no increased cancer risk or damage to the body from higher exposure to UV light that is enough to cause DNA damage or sunburn. It doesn't penetrate below the skin as a result of this. Now, essentially, any, any other part of the light spectrum is going to be somewhere in between. So, for example, blue and red lights penetrate somewhere between like one and a couple centimeters, like two or three centimeters. So, infrared light has the most effect. And infrared light, similar to UV light, is outside of the visible spectrum. So, infrared light is felt more as heat. If you've ever been in like an infrared sauna, for example, it relies on infrared light to generate its heat. And... This infrared light actually is going to simulate cytochrome C oxidase through the fact that it essentially acts as a chromophore. It contains some of the different heme and copper containing protein structures, similar to those found in red blood cells, but in a little bit different orientation, that actually allow it to absorb this part of the light spectrum specifically. And this excitation actually speeds up oxidative phosphorylation or stimulates it. So infrared light plays a very important and beneficial role in mitochondrial function and health. There's an interesting field of research which has kind of come out over the last couple decades that is looking at what's known as photobiomodulation. And photobiomodulation is essentially the use of red and infrared light therapy to treat or manage different conditions. And they've actually found efficacy in a lot of different health conditions it seems to have broad beneficial effects for a lot of different health conditions just through this infrared light simulation. And the effects on mitochondria are thought to be the primary explanation for its effects. Because when you increase oxidative phosphorylation, you see an increase in mitochondrial energy production. This increases the intercellular water production. This increases your ATP. And it also increases the creation of what are known as reactive oxygen species. Now, reactive oxygen species are also known as free radicals. And essentially, a free radical is any molecule that contains at least one unpaired electron. So because the oxidative phosphorylation process deals in protons and electrons, in some cases, an electron can end up binding to or reacting with a molecule when it's not really supposed to. So for example, oxygen can bind to an extra electron forming what's known as superoxide. And these free radicals actually in the right context act as almost like a beneficial stressor. Now when free radicals aren't managed properly, it can cause issues such as damage to mitochondrial membranes or cell membranes or different protein structures, because to fill out their electron shell, they will actually steal electrons from other molecules around them. And since electrons are responsible for holding together a lot of the bonds in chemistry, 
this essentially is going to cause these bonds to break. So they can essentially break a lipid in half into fragments and things like that. And because now we have an electron imbalance in the fragments of that molecule that's just been broken up, that also is oxidized and will go on to interact with the molecules in a way where it's also stealing electrons. This process of electron loss is called oxidation. When you give something an electron, it's called reduction or it being reduced. Now, antioxidants, their role is specifically to reduce these free radicals or neutralize these free radicals through donating one of their own electrons. So they're designed to kind of give up electrons specifically for this process. Now, when you increase the ATP production, the reactive oxygen species and other factors like this through infrared light stimulation, it actually activates some of the different transcription changes in genes that increase the antioxidant production and some of the other things like that. It's almost like a hormetic response or a beneficial stressor. And this seems to be what's responsible for a lot of the benefit of infrared light exposure is this hormetic effect on mitochondria and this stimulation of energy metabolism. Now it is worth noting here that actually blue light has kind of an opposite effect here. Blue light seems to inhibit some of the different uh, pathways in oxidative phosphorylation. And so when you compare blue light and red light in cell studies, red light stimulates increased ADP levels and blue light actually inhibits it in some way. So it seems to either be targeting cytochrome C oxidase or potentially one of the other transporters. Now it's also worth noting that some of the other cytochromes also interact with light in different ways. Though infrared light seems to have the biggest effect since it penetrates so deep into the body, you actually also see effects with UV light, for example, interacting with the um, interacting with the NAD plus cofactor or cytochrome one. It seems to excite electrons there and actually may drive some of this reaction. And then uh, other parts of the light spectrum may also interact with cytochrome two or uh, the cofactor FAD because they act as uh, they essentially contain what are called flavins, which as you might have seen earlier, are some of the chromophores. So they also may have a relationship with light, though this is going to be more of a surface level interaction because these parts of light spectrum beyond infrared light only reach a few centimeters below the skin tops. Now I also wanted to talk about the role of water in mitochondria. Now, for those of you that aren't aware of the work of Gerald Pollack on structured water, water has some very unique properties. Essentially, it's one of the only substances that's more dense as a liquid than as a solid. And this occurs because water essentially acts as what's known as a liquid crystal. Essentially, it forms these kind of transient bonds that give it a certain kind of geometrical structure, even in a liquid state as a result of interactions between the hydrogen and oxygen atoms. So the hydrogen atoms hold a slight positive charge and the oxygen atoms hold a slight negative charge. So water is what's known as a dipole. Now a dipole is basically like a small, almost like molecular magnet where one side is more positive and one side is more negative. And in water, this has to do with the density of the oxygen atom which draws more electrons towards itself. So it gets a slightly more negative charge. Whereas the hydrogens, their nucleus in comparison to oxygen is so light and not as dense. So they essentially just hold the proton portion and as more than the electron portion. And as a result, they have a slightly more positive charge. So the positive hydrogens are attracted to the negativity of the oxygen and as a result, they form these kind of bond geometry structures. It's a tetrahedral pyramid structure. This is on a larger scale responsible for the geometry of ice crystals, for example. Now, this organization property of water occurs mostly when it gets down to lower temperatures. You see it most clearly in ice, for example. But there's some conditions under which water also organizes or structures itself in a very unique way. The work of Gerald Pollack, essentially he and his team found that when exposed to hydrophilic materials or materials that interact easily or well with water, causes the water to form a more specific, more crystal-like geometry 
that actually causes it to hold more negative charge and exclude larger particles. So it almost forms like an ice-like structure even though it's still in a semi-liquid state. So this was originally dubbed the fourth phase of water when uh, Pollock and his team first found it, and it's, this is the name of their book on the subject as well. Now this has some very interesting properties, but one of them is that it's more gel-like than other forms of water. And we actually see this in mitochondria, and I'll explain why in a moment. But interestingly, in mitochondria, the water is actually 15 to 20 times more viscous or gel-like than in the rest of the cell. And in cells in general, the water is even more viscous. So compared to distilled water, the water in mitochondria is actually 50 times more viscous. So this is a significant amount of this structuring process. Now, the reason this happens is actually because protein is a hydro highly electrophilic substance. Now, protein essentially interacts with water in a way where it's going to cause more water structuring. And in a sense, you know, the cell is almost entirely filled with protein. It's about 40% of the volume of the cell and the mitochondria even more so is filled with protein. You might remember seeing earlier some of the pictures of mitochondria where they had these kind of indentions in the inner membrane that form almost like a wrinkled look on the inside of the mitochondria. These are known as cristae and they uh, serve to almost increase the surface area of the inner membrane of the mitochondria, both to give more room on the mitochondria for the oxidative phosphorylation proteins to be held. So there's more potential sites for oxidative phosphorylation to be carried out. But this also has the unique effect of increasing the surface area for proteins and things to interact with water. Cell membranes also have this same effect because they're also hydrophilic on the outside of the cell membranes. This causes an increase in water structuring and makes the water inside the mitochondria very structured, and this gives it some unique properties. One of these is that structured water lends itself to what's known as coherence. Now, essentially coherence is a property in quantum physics where you see a behavior of a material almost behaving more as like a unified material than as a dis ordered liquid or something like that. So normally we see this in what are known as supercooled states. So when you cool something down to very close to absolute zero, you actually see some materials become coherent or organized in the sense that when one part of the material is altered, the entire material is altered as a result. So the vibrations and the movement of the molecules are synchronized. Now, this doesn't happen to a perfect extent in life, you know, because life is not at a super cold temperature. It's not under these extreme conditions that we see, but it is still mathematically feasible for lower levels of coherence to be carried out. So this is what's known as partial coherence. You almost see these kind of pockets of coherence where coherence is formed transiently and only in smaller areas. And as a result, this allows the water inside the cell to transmit energy and information in a unique way. You can think of it almost like this. So if you have a pond or a pool of water and you put a material down into it, like a stick or something with a distinctive shape and you move it around in the water, if you had a very precise, uh, almost like an echolocation device that was able to pick up the vibrations and their shape and their vibration frequency and things like that, you would actually be able to pick up the exact shape and movement of the material that you'd put into the water. This is kind of the logic behind sonar. So essentially, when you are in this state, you have the transmission of energy and information at the same time about the shape of different molecules. So as an example here, there's an interesting kind of paradox in biology where when gene transcription enzymes that bind to DNA and actually read the um, segment of DNA and transcribe it. They interact with particular segments of DNA. And when they're in the nucleus looking for this particular segment, they've actually been shown to find it and bind to it roughly 100 times faster than should be possible according to the standard just random diffusion mechanism that we see. So this seems to indicate that they're almost magnetically drawn together based on similarities in structure and the, the ability that they have to bind to each other. 
and this seems to stem from this water structuring. So what we see is essentially the enzyme actually orients water in a particular way and the coherence of the water inside the cell allows this orientation to travel much further than it would normally. So this gives the enzyme almost like a radius of activity where its information and bonding orientation is transmitted or carried out a little ways around it so that the surface area that it has to travel or the surface area that it has to bind to the segment of DNA, or really this could apply to any other enzyme as well, uh, that area is larger. So it has more potential and more likelihood of interacting. And if we think of it as the DNA having the same effect as well, you can see this is multiplied even further. So this allows enzymes to have very specific activity and be carried out very effectively across the cell. And so this is almost a sort of non-local interaction, like the model that we kind of tend to visualize when it comes to biology, that enzymes and proteins and things that are supposed to bond together just kind of float around randomly until they just bump into each other and then fit together at just the right angle. That doesn't really work in an actual sense of how fast and how efficiently life is able to carry out energy transfer and reactions and things like that. So when we actually look at the way biology carries out reactions like this, they always happen faster than would be predicted by this kind of just wet machinery model of the cell. And it seems to all point directly to this state of coherence playing a huge role in how cells interact and how enzymes and things like that are able to function so efficiently. Now, one of the other that we see this kind of have some relevance is in the work of a guy named Dr. Gilbert Ling. So he actually, before the work of Gerald Pollack, he was one of the first people to propose something along the lines of this like water structuring model. And his theory was what's known as the polarized oriented multi-layer theory of cell water, or sometimes also called the association induction hypothesis. Now, essentially, he believed that proteins were unfolded, this process being driven by ATP, and that this actually allowed water to interact with more surface area along the protein, and that the positive and negative points in the protein structure at each of the bonding sites were actually going to orient the water in a particular way that created this organization where the water was lined up with the positive and negative ends kind of facing each other and the this positive negative alteration traveling outward from the protein and dissipating the further it got from the protein. So his thought was that instead of driving energy production the way we typically think, that ATP may actually help more so in the process of unfolding the proteins and that this may cause more surface area of the protein for the water to be exposed to and then that increase in water structuring, he believed, actually played a key role in energy production and metabolism. And I'm inclined to agree to an extent here. He believed that ATP did not serve the role we think it does. Now, he dismissed it almost entirely, but one of the big things that he pointed out that I think is relevant here is that ATP actually is not enough of an energy carrier to fulfill the energy needs of the cell. The math that he carried out actually indicates that with the amount of ATP that could feasibly be produced in a day, given the normal caloric intake and all that, it would only be able to fill out about one three thousandths of the actual energy needs for the cell. And this is including ATP recycling and things like that too. So this deficit of energy seems to indicate that cells are able to either process energy more efficiently than is possible or should be possible according to our standard models, or that they have some other source of energy production. Now, as far as the efficiency of energy, I believe that structured water plays a big role here. Because in water structuring and in a coherent state, we see essentially an increased ability of water to conduct protons and electrons across it. This is known as proton or electron superconduction. And this process seems to create a state of long distance energy transfer where electrons or protons that are needed for different reactions are actually able to be transferred 
dramatically longer distances than should be possible. It's not like they go from one molecule directly to a molecule next to them, but they actually have the ability to conduct across distances to fill these kind of gaps. So if a positive charge opens up when an electron is lost in another molecule, that this electron from another molecule may jump across. This may increase the efficiency of antioxidants. This may increase the ability of the cytochromes to pick up electrons and protons. There's a lot of cases where this could be relevant in biology. And essentially, I believe that this is one way that life actually has the ability to increase its efficiency up to the point of almost like a zero entropy state. And this was proposed um, most notably by a researcher named uh, Mei Wan Ho, who wrote a book called The Rainbow and the Worm. And she had a very interesting uh, exploration of this, and it is definitely mathematically feasible. So essentially, Ling thought that really this water structuring acted kind of as a battery and helped facilitate this conduction. And other people have built on his work like Mei Wan Ho. Now, one of the other potential mechanisms here for energy production that I see is also that basically the cell is set up in a way that actually funnels loss energy back into itself. So if we look at energy efficiency in any other reaction or in human machinery or things like that, most energy is lost in the form of heat. Now, heat actually can be channeled back into energy production in cells. And I believe this happens through the protein collagen. Collagen essentially has this property known as a, it's known as a pyroelectric molecule. And this essentially means that it converts heat into electric excitation. It's also what's known as a piezoelectric molecule. And Piezoelectricity is a property that you may be familiar with if you've ever looked into the electric properties of quartz, for example. Piezoelectricity is the creation of electric conduction under pressure. So, for example, if you put a piece of quartz in under a very strong vice where it's being put under constant pressure, you can actually hook it up to uh, electric wires and it can actually power some sort of small device. And there's many videos of this online if you look. Now, Collagen seems to have the same property, but with the added property of also being pyroelectric, meaning that it can funnel actually chemical pressures or changes in the chemical structure or things like that um, of the cell in general. So any pressure that's put on the cell is created in the form or it creates electricity in the form of collagen being excited by this. Any heat applied to collagen is going to have a similar property. And I believe that this electric excitation also feeds back into the cell. And this also increases both the energy production in a sense, and also reduces the loss of energy in the form of heat. Really, like if we didn't have some sort of system like this in place, I believe that the heat from the energy reactions being carried out in the body would burn us alive because we're carrying out so many high energy reactions that really it should be disproportionate to the balance of temperature and stability in the cell. It should cause an extreme level of excitation. So this seems to be a system set up to diffuse this energy loss back into the energy production. And this depends heavily on coherence. Now, the other thing worth noting here too is that Actually, collagen fills up the majority of the structural proteins in the cell. There are a type of protein structures known as microtubules that were originally thought to perform mostly a structural role. They were thought to hold the cell in some sort of stability or give it a particular shape or things like that. But they're essentially just these free-floating little straws or tubes made of collagen protein. Now, I believe that the role of these collagen proteins is essentially actually to pick up some of this lost energy, and they may also act as kind of a almost instantaneous transport system for electrons and protons across the cell, because they're called microtubules because they're essentially these very narrow tubes. And it's been shown actually that microtubules have the ability to conduct light, electrons and protons through these tubes, probably as a result of the fact that they are essentially very narrow, so they're able to diffuse light, and then they have a high level of water structuring inside them because they're in such a confined space and they're essentially made of hydrophilic material. So this seems to spontaneously pull 
the protons and electrons through them so they're able to transform them across even longer distances and this enhances this kind of coherent idea of the cell even more so you know as you can see mitochondria have some potentially almost magical properties in the sense that they're able to reduce entropy so dramatically that this can be carried out across the cell now one other thing i wanted to mention too is circling back to the role of light in mitochondria is the fact that mitochondria actually have the ability to produce their own light and heat this is used to maintain body temperature so if you've ever gotten into like an ice bath or something like that you'll notice that you almost have this immediate rush of adrenaline now the adrenaline release has this effect on cells where it actually increases their production of heat in this context so it's kind of a signal to the body to begin producing more of its own body heat and there's some other regulation of this as well through temperature sensing now the way that this works is actually similar to oxidative phosphorylation it also relies on what's known as the proton motive or osmotic force here and essentially this has to do with what are known as uncoupling proteins so in the picture on the left here you'll see oxidative phosphorylation we have the cytochromes that are carried out um, and then you have the ATP synthase, the motor enzyme that's allowing the hydrogen ions back in. Now there's these uncoupling proton, uh, proteins are also found in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. So they also constitute a sort of opening or channel for protons to flow back through, but they don't produce any ATP. They don't have any ATP production potential. They just open up this channel so that protons can flow through at whatever rate they're able to. Now, this can almost be thought of as putting a wire on one end of a battery and then looping it around to the other end without connecting anything in between. The electricity is going to travel across the proton and the battery is going to lose energy over time because some of that is dissipated as heat. Rather than hooking it up to a light bulb or a motor or something like that, where it's going to carry out a task or drive some reaction, while at the same time some is also lost as heat there. So you always are going to lose some energy as heat. But this significantly increases the energy loss through this pathway because it's not doing anything else. It essentially uncouples the flow of protons from ATP production, and that's why it's known as an uncoupling protein. So this process actually has some ability to produce not only heat, but heat in the form of infrared light. And this seems to actually act as a beneficial stressor to the other cells around it because mitochondria are actually able to emit their own infrared light through this sense and this gives heat a much greater diffusion radius through the body and may also act as kind of a beneficial stressor and be responsible for some of the benefits that we are seeing in some studies on cold exposure such as uh, increased mitochondria count in general now cells also have the ability to emit light in other ways too so essentially cells have been shown to emit what's known as uh, biophotons these are essentially low levels of light that are concentrated and emitted to cells around them for different purposes in bacteria these serve a signaling function or they can serve as distress signals so bacteria actually use a low level of light to signal um, but this is not in the visible light spectrum so this is below what we can actually perceive ourselves this is why animals and plants and things like that don't look directly fluorescent most of the time at least but there are some modern kind of instruments that we can use to increase the uh, signal to the point where it's actually trackable and these are known as um, uh, photon multipliers and they're devices that are used to measure this so cells are going to interact with any level of light exposure even this low level biophoton emission so it's possible that cells and even mitochondria and things like that as well can influence each other back and forth through this light emission even if it's not perceptible with modern equipment for the most part now the question is how are cells concentrating this light because light should just be diffused and run into a lot of different chromophores and things like that it seems that cells actually act almost like a laser in the sense that they collect light that's produced as a byproduct of energy metabolism. I mentioned earlier that free radicals contain that uh, missing electron uh, and that's essentially an excited state of the free radical and it makes it very reactive. When that 
free radical is neutralized and its electron state goes back down to baseline, it actually emits some level of light. So mitochondria are the largest producers of light emission inside the cell by a significant margin because they have the highest production of these free radicals and the neutralization of those. So mitochondria are feeding in this energy from the protons and electrons from food and maybe from sunlight as well since sunlight also increases this reactive oxygen species level. And these reactive oxygen species are then dropping back down to their base state and releasing light in the process. Now, when we look at mitochondria alone, they actually don't have the ability to emit light. There was a study at one point where they looked at cells with a nucleus and without a nucleus, both having mitochondria, and they found that only the cell with the nucleus actually emitted a significant amount of biophotons. So the nucleus has the unique role here of actually organizing the light and synchronizing it or collecting it in a way that makes it concentrated enough that it re-emits in a way that's actually visible to other cells and measurement equipment. So looking at this model of the uh, laser on the right, what you see here is an energy source, a source for the light to enter, which is the mitochondria. You have the medium, which uh, requires kind of a high level of light to be able to travel through it. This is the structured water in the cell or water in general in the cell. And then you have reflective materials that allow the light to concentrate and be transmitted out. And this reflective material is actually DNA. There's been some studies on the optical properties of DNA that found that DNA essentially has the ability to trap light to an extent. It actually acts as a chromophore. And this allows light to be reflected back and forth to some extent, and it traps certain parts of the light spectrum, but not others. So it reflects only part of the light back. And then this light, once it outpaces the kind of reflection, will actually be transmitted out of the cell from the nucleus. And this actually is coherent light to an extent because of this property of some of the light being diffused. So this forms what's called organized or coherent light. And this is essentially the wavelengths of the light are restricted by this process down to a particular frequency and a particular organization. And this forms almost like a laser in the sense that lasers are also coherent light. So this is how cells are able to re-emit light. And this, this is really a fascinating property of the cell at large that relies heavily on the mitochondria. So mitochondria, their role isn't just energy production. It's really so much more than that. They have to do a lot in the way of light emission. Um, they're one of the main ways that light affects the cell. And they also produce body heat and other things like that too. So just to kind of wrap this up here, mitochondria are some of the most fascinating elements of the cell by far. They have very unique properties in the way they function with water, the way they actually emit electromagnetic energy, the way they actually emit light and interact with light. And they are essential for energy production. When your mitochondria is dysfunctional as a result of anything, you know, this could be maybe lack of light exposure or uh, potentially mutations or aging that cause mitochondria to become less functional over time. This is known as heteroplasmy. Essentially, through these long-term changes or changes from different toxic stimuli or things like that, we see a lack of function in mitochondria. And I believe this is linked to many, many diseases today and many issues with metabolism and things like that too. So this is something I want to be focusing more on in the future. This is something I'm going to be hopefully doing some more lectures on in the future and a topic that I really want to continue exploring in depth. Maybe we'll do one on the function of collagen and some more on how it actually conducts light and electricity. DNA also has some similar properties like this too. DNA also has some ability to act as a semiconductor and it has some very interesting interactions of light that we can explore further too. So I definitely want to continue talking about some of this stuff and do some more lectures in the future. But for now, I'll leave it at that. Hopefully, I really inspired some of you guys to look further into this and do some research of your own. I'll link some studies on some of the different topics that I discussed in the video description below. And for now, I hope you guys enjoyed and have a great rest of your day.